103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, February 21st, 2021. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Doubter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Well, it's been one week, because I've been in this house for one week. Uh, one week, because yeah. all the snow. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll be able to get out next week. <laughs> Our guests today are Doubtfire, Boudreaux, and Buffalo. Hello, all. Hello, hello. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. Conversely, we also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in Knoxville, well, you're just not. There are several atheist, free-thinking, and rationalist groups that exist right here in Knoxville, and we'll be telling you how you can connect with them right after the mid-show break. Also, did you know that there was a streaming atheist call-in TV show broadcasting here in Knoxville and has been for 10 years? Did you know that one bet? Yeah, but if they have a hyperbolic time chamber that lets them train as much as they want in 24 hours, why don't they just always use it? Always be on the line? Always be training? Yeah. Yeah. That's not our show, but we always are online because the archives are on YouTube. Anybody can go to YouTube and find Knoxville Atheists or Knoxville Free Thought videos. Wombat, well, what's our topic for today? Right. Hey, Where we're, we actually, we're actually going to have Scott leave the topic, but I think we're going to be asking the question of do your beliefs match your actions? But before we get into the main show, I really like to have just a quick, a super fast, super, super neat. Super, 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 like, trimmed section of how everyone's life is doing in the next 30 seconds. We'll start with Scott. How have you been for the last 30 seconds, your whole life story? Can you wrap it up? Come on. Oh, got time. Come on. At a debate last yeah. week. Yeah. How about the debate? Really well. Yeah, it went pretty good. Um, I didn't perform as well as I wanted because I was kind of uh, not prepared for my interlocutor's um Lack of knowledge, I guess, on the topic we were talking about. So it was kind of hard to navigate that situation. But that went okay. It went well. It was um, the format. Did you have a – did you – I mean, when you say debate, I'm thinking two people at a podium and a yep. moderator. Or were you – was it more conversational? How would it go? Yeah, it was um, structured. So it was um, opening, rebuttal, wow, uh, counter. Then it was um, open discussion. Then it went into con- um, closing statements. Wow. And it was on the um, Empathetic Atheist YouTube channel. So check that out. Yeah. Okay. So we did that. Um, and then, yeah, everything's been going great this week, you know, other than everything's that. Everything's been going great this week? Just wonderful. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. That's great to hear. You're in Trump country. You, you should be fine. You should be fine. Over yeah, there. I'm wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Boudreaux, how you doing? Looking spiffy. Um, I'm well. I had a, had a good week. We are fine the snow and uh, uh things are getting better so uh, i'm i'm pleased that we're on the on the down of that um yeah. I, I i did something fun and tracked all the walks uh runs and ellipticals that i've done since the lockdown and put it put it in some graphs and put it on facebook it's kind of nice. fun 875 miles wow. 875 walks uh wow. amazingly um yeah neat so it was fun, it was fun. and yeah we walked a lot uh, yeah. and i suspect george is gonna share some buffalo is gonna share some news about what his daughter did uh this week shoot let's uh, go to george yeah george which, Since george, which, which, on, I guess which, george da- oh, which daughter <laughs> uh, the one i married <laughs> okay <laughs> you remember uh, she was she was pretty excited about giving a presentation to uh, i guess it was a zoom presentation that included uh, where some somehow I don't know the details, but it was based at Cornell, and it was on her um, her business, her specialty, and that is uh, regulation of the uh, pet food industry. Okay. And uh, she's uh, I she she argued she was very pleased to have done that with the particular audience, a lot of people from the FDA and so forth. But I think it's much more significant that she's a past president of the national organization 
of, uh, of regulators of the, the pet food industry. And that, that, that I think is, uh, and she's done that. She had a stint on that for, uh, for a couple of years. That's, that's real work, you know, Good. Just yeah. giving a talk, talk is one thing, but, but do it, but get down there and, and, and doing the, putting in the hours is, is quite another, but anyway, that was great to hear about. She was very excited about it. Yeah. I mean, we love our pets. And then, t- and then today we're going to get together and, and watch the uh, U S women's uh, soccer team. The, uh, the, uh, uh, she believes tournament is going on and we're going to be playing a, the Brazilians who are a very tough, tough team. So that's going to be exciting. It's going to be is fun to two watch. national teams or do they have names? Two national teams. I see. I see. Yeah. So it's USA versus Brazil. Right. Cool. 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 Nice. All right. Who are you cheering for? <laughs> yeah, I had trouble last week when uh, USA played Canada. I was torn yeah. on who I was here for. Sure, Just, sure, yeah. sure. I know, right? Because they, hey, they were so polite. You know, what are you going to do? Well, uh, Larry, how you been holding up? I'm doing well. Just staying in, staying safe. I'm 70, so I don't really have to get out that much. Um, playing a lot of computer games and uh, watching some TV. Nice. That's it. Yeah. What's the new What's the new uh, TV channel du jour? Just oh, me. we just got through watching the Mandalorian. The oh, yeah. 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 it was pretty good. Yeah. It was pretty yeah. good. He says, yeah. "Yeah, a few things." Uh, I'm a science fiction nut, <laughs> okay, uh, or geek. So, I mean, uh-huh. two guys can't put together a, a space worthy spa- uh, spaceship. Um, in a couple of days, <laughs> which is one of the things that supposedly happened with no external help and no external tools. I just, I don't, I, I, uh, <laughs> just won't happen. <laughs> yeah. Biting my tongue here, but this is way, way in the past. So who knows what kind of technology they had back then? Who knows what kind of That's setup? true. Right. 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 right? Yeah, it was all Lego block. Yeah, it's all <laughs> snap. You just need crystals and Lego pieces. That's it. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I've been trapped in the snow. Like I said, uh, we had that brizzle. Uh, blizzard come down uh, Friday, last Friday, everything looked pretty clean and sunny and bright. That was like a really nice picture. And then this dark cloud came in in the evening and we woke up Saturday, more or less in what I would say, like a quasi blizzard, except it was just hail and it was constant hail for like 26 hours. <laughs> Tiny little pieces of ice built up and stacked and froze together into solid chunks. And so when we went, by the time it was Sunday and and we we got up, we we're like, uh, I can't get out of the parking lot. Like my car is literally encased in an igloo. And so like work was just shut down. All the roads were blocked. Sanitation workers couldn't come out. Gas stations were shut down because no one could go to attend them. Like Walmart shut down for a period of time. There was like nothing for anybody. Everyone just stayed home. Thankfully, we did some, uh, um, I guess, what you would call emergency shopping beforehand, before the storm hit, because we heard so much from New York. But it is a crazy thing. Weather is crazy. And it's not just, you know, weather. It's obviously getting more extreme. Like the winters are getting more cold. Summers are getting more hot. And I'm glad that we have at least the perspective of having an administrative or administration that's willing to recognize the problem for what it is and roll up their sleeves. If not fix the problem, or at least start fixing the problem, recognize that there is a problem there. Right. Question, Ty. Hey, talk to me. Yeah. Did you lose, did you lose a lot of trees? Did this ice do a lot of damage to the trees? So not in my local area. No, I have not seen any tree loss though. I have not left. (laughs) I've not left my block in the last seven days. So I don't really know what the rest of the world looks like right now. (laughs) Uh, We, we, we got quite a bit of ice on the trees as well, but I think the saving uh, was this year was unlike 2009 is there was no wind. Ah, so there okay. wasn't as much uh, uh, power loss, at least in our general central Kentucky area. Sure. And, and there wasn't so much damage to the trees. It's not going to be so messy afterward, in other words. Good. I will tell you this one thing. I almost went ice skating. That's how bad it was. Like there's a very, very shallow lake right outside my window. And I said, you know what? I know this lake isn't deep. I know it was had water beforehand. I know I won't fall like a meter or whatever in the water or anything like that. I got the ice skates right here and I can't rollerblade. And I live, I've been rollerblading like all this year. I'm like, let me just put them on and go out there. And I was like, no, don't do it. It's not worth it. Cause one, I'm older now. And two, I realized when I wear roller, when I go out rollerblading, I'm wearing the helmet. I got the wrist guards. I got the knee pads. I'm wearing like a whole bunch of PPE and I fall all the time. 
ice skating, there's just this convention of, yeah, you don't wear PPE. You just go out there and if you fall, you fall. I'm like, ice is way harder than pavement. What are you doing? So uh, yeah, did not do that. Not worth getting the injury. I will keep to rollerblading. Anyway, Scott, that was quick. <laughs> uh, let's take a break. Like I said, like I, yeah. said, like I said, super quick. I hey. show. <laughs> I already had a topic for us today. Well, it was something about like our actions don't match our beliefs. What's that all about? Yeah. So the question is, does our actions really match our beliefs? And um, there's a lot of folks in the field of um, psychology um, that would say that they don't like uh, there's a PhD, Leslie Becker Phelps, who did a piece on this and psychology today writes a book and things of that nature and talks about how the evidence kind of shows that people um, talk about what they believe as an afterthought to their actions. And sometimes people wind up not acting on what they say they believe because of that very reason that, you know, they don't, they don't really act on their beliefs at all. Um, people say they believe what they act on, um, but then sometimes they don't really believe that, um, deep inside. Like, for example, hmm. I had that debate on free will last week. Yeah. So I'm one of these people that don't believe in libertarian free will yet every day I act as though I do like every day I'm making choices and I feel like I'm free and, and I, in my language, you know, reflects that you know, that I have freedom and things of that nature, that I have free choices. And it's kind of good that, that I do. The science even says that people who make the story and they kind of believe and reinforce the idea of free choice end up being more causative in their, you know, behaviors and things like that. And it's just weird semantics. And it's really hard for people to grasp that subject, for example, because it's so intuitive you know, and so we, again, we make stories that sort of, um, line up with our, with our behaviors and sometimes not, that's not the case at all. So another example that you could say is that, you know, um, let's say if you pay attention to your thoughts, let's say if you're having a problem with your boss at work and you may think that your boss sees you as stupid and you feel like it's true, but say, if you were to really think about it and reflect on the praise that she gave you at different times, you may realize that this thought does not really make a whole lot of sense. And in circumstances like this, it can help remind yourself just because it feels true, doesn't make it true. But even in that process of thinking and kind of understanding, yeah, she probably doesn't think I'm stupid. I'm probably blowing out of perspective you can be easily triggered by that same person because this thought is just ruminating so much. It's becoming a habit to where you just act on every little criticism that person gives you because you have this idea that, you know, she thinks you're stupid, even though you know different. So it's just one of those weird things. I think that this is kind of, um, this is kind of interesting. And then the question is how can we use that to help, help ourselves? you know, so just to condense the thoughts so far, I'm thinking like our feelings can be very subjective and oftentimes even confusing things, even for the person who's experiencing them, such that the actions that are born from those emotions may not even be in line with those emotions. And so the question would be like, are our emotions in line with our beliefs? Are our beliefs in line with our actions? And like, what's really controlling what? Like, where does the circle begin? And where does it terminate at? It clearly or terminates at like maybe an action, but is that motivated by uh, uh, a set of like morales or beliefs that we say we have? Or are they more guttural uh, emotions that we're just operating on at the moment? And we're retroactively making it seem like it's a belief after the fact. Is, is that's that right. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, um, uh, for like, for me, it took like when I left Jehovah's witnesses, for example, when I, I had beliefs that, or feelings that the Jehovah's witnesses were true. And then those beliefs became just out of my intellectual, uh, wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. 
but there was something always making me act a certain way because I, you know, I, I was, I had scrupulosity, you know, I was so, um, concerned about, you know, having God's approval and my behaviors and things like that. It was a hard habit to shake. Mm -hmm. And so my actions didn't really reflect my true beliefs at that point. You know, I had dropped all those beliefs, but yet I was still kind of worried about, you know, not living forever and all these promises that I had kind of made part of my identity in my thoughts, you know? Okay. So I think like the real question is like, are we, are actions more strongly informed by a belief that we have, or are they strong, more strongly motivated by our emotions? Maybe we can ask that around, right? Buffalo, what do you think? Do you think it's fair to say that your actions are more motivated by your beliefs than your emotions? Can someone actually be that belief oriented? Um, I don't know. I think. Uh oh. Between the beliefs and, and the, uh, the action. And then there's a balance of whether or not our desire and need for creature comforts, whatever they are, whether they're social acceptability or they are indeed, uh, you know, physical comforts, uh, that that interferes and you end up somewhere in between. Hmm. Yeah. I can definitely see like, uh, an equilibrium there, right? It's not, it, maybe it's not entirely one thing. Do you see yourself as more belief oriented or more, uh, emotion oriented in terms of, uh, definitely I'm not belief oriented because I don't really believe in anything. I conclude. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was an easy one for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Boudreaux, I'm going to throw this out at you. Uh, do you find yourself more motivated by your beliefs or do you find yourself more motivated by your emotions and how do you parse the two? And for argument's sake, we can replace belief with conclusions here to satisfy yeah, 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 George's yeah, yeah, yeah. point. Not, I'm not uh, touching yeah. it. <laughs> right, right, right. Semantics. I don't know. I, I guess uh, uh, I, I dare say none of us probably really pay attention to this level, uh, you know, unless you're really, really meditating on it. But um, I'd like to think uh, uh, I'm, I'm more belief based and, and less emotion based, but I, I definitely feel like if there are things I'm passionate about that, yeah. that kind of feels like it's an emotional belief that probably goes on the other side. Um, I, I do find that, uh, uh, actually I've got a, I've got a fun list of, of, uh, of things that I often you know, kind of clash with people on yeah. that, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of, probably fall into the emotional category there, sure, but sure. I try to back it up with facts. So I don't know. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Probably a mix, maybe favoring the belief side. I'll, I can tell you where I can conclude. I can say my emotion driven actions are way more fun mm -hmm. than my belief driven actions, almost yeah. 10 out of 10 times. And so if it's something serious, I will try to operate on beliefs, but if it's for my own recreational benefit, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go on emotional. I'll do whatever I want. Emotional wise. That's as far as free will, as you guys are defining it for this conversation allow. <laughs> I will be motivated by that. Larry, what do you think? Uh, are you more emotion driven, belief driven? What do you, how do you, just um, well, I, I'd say that uh, most people are a mix of both. Obviously, yeah. uh, what comes in the problem is that, uh, the hypocrisy um, of a lot of believers, you know, they'll they, they'll say something like uh, that God can see everything and knows everything, but then you'll find out that some preacher has cheated on his wife yeah. or has has hired a homosexual. Um, prostitute you know does he think that god no longer sees it or does he not believe that god sees all this stuff yeah you know that's what gets me they're not acting as if their beliefs are true hmm. but they're they're telling everybody else what to believe based on you know their professed beliefs good example of that of mother Teresa. do mm -hmm. you want to touch on that you know the mother Teresa hypocrisy mm -hmm. larry or should I? Well, there's it? a whole book on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Christopher Hitchens put out yeah. a book. Uh, what was the title of that one? Escapes Anybody know? Me. Escapes me. Uh, anyway, yeah. um, she uh, she professed 
uh, theoretically taking care of all these uh, poor people in Calcutta and India. Uh, but it turns out that what she was doing was just uh, taking them in, putting them on a, a cheap mat, and laying them on the floor by the dozens and hundreds, and just allowing them to suffer. Hmm. And in her own words, suffer was next, suffering is next to godliness. Uh, it was what Jesus did for us. So let them suffer is basically what she did. But then she went all around the world gathering money right. to take care of these people and, right. and working on the uh, stated assumption that she was literally helping them to get that money. Uh, that's hypocrisy. And then she got sick. And, uh, what, and did she, she went to get the best medical attention she could find, it and reminds, no matter what it cost. And we don't have to go all the way back in the past. We've had Trump, for example, say, hey, you know, you don't have to worry about the coronavirus. Like, have you tried, I don't know, maybe injecting bleach into your system? Have, can we, is there a light ray or a flashlight we can get to kill these viruses? Mm -hmm. I have coronavirus. I started a, a rally that gave everyone coronavirus. Well, give me the good stuff. All right. Yeah. Great. I yeah, got forget the, good the bleach. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me the good stuff. And then he comes back and he takes off his face mask and then people just keep taking off their face masks. It's just like, what are you doing? Uh, and don't forget about Tom Cruise and Cancun. I like Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I like Tom, Tom Cruise approach. Yeah, and that book, by the way, is called The Missionary Position. Oh. <laughs> Mother <laughs> Teresa How in theory. How that name? That's that a great name for a book. Yeah. But, but, but I'm, I'm Mother Teresa, not that I know that much about her. Uh, she did spend her entire life uh, interacting with those poor people and giving some of them hope or something. In the and, time and that she wasn't the, money raising, you mean? No, she was money raising, but she generated an army of, uh, of other like thinking people that, that went into the slums and took care of those people. Uh, and, take care of them or gather them up and put them on the floor and just let them suffer. Yeah, there well, was, they, a big they, difference they, they, they did feed them. I don't know where they fed them, but, um, you know, they subjected themselves to, uh, to disease and, and I'm sure a lot of awful smells. Um, to give these some of these people some hope, and I don't know whether yeah. that's that, that's right or wrong, but I think it's kind of co it's a complex sort of issue. And then her confessions at the end that she doubted that she doubted God in the end were I think very interesting. And those letters mm -hmm. that she didn't want to be to published until well she didn't want them to be published. Yeah. If I can make an analogy, I've once had a really bad ulcer that I had to go to the doctor to to repair. And instead of giving me a pep talk that made me feel really hopeful and like a sandwich to feed me and like a nice mat to lie down on, he gave me a prescription that actually helped me get rid of the ulcer. And I would say 10 out of 10 times, if you put yourself in position or inhibit someone from getting in position to get meaningful standard of help and care, you're not helping. And right. even if you give me a really nice pep talk and a nice sandwich and you feed me and, you, and I smell bad and you're around me, that's not helping me get actual help. We should have standards for help and standards for help that actually reduce my harm, the harm that I'm doing to myself or harm that's going on in the community are always gonna be better than just a pat on the back. And I, I, when I look at the Mother Teresa story, I just see lip service at the highest tier. It, it looks great, it feels great, but it does nothing. It's crackers. You're just eating and getting no nutritional value. And so uh, it's up to us to have a better standard for that. Bujo, what do you think? This kind of ties in another thing that's been uh, uh, talked about quite a bit that I think wor is worth bringing into this conversation. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah. You know I mean? How about the smallest possible effort that I could give to your cause? And, you know, especially on, on a Facebook post uh -huh. or something like that, it's <clears throat> like, you know, uh, my, my family's all sick and we're out of food and, and uh, uh, you know, someone just died. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. No, yeah, like, yeah. hey, let me set up a, right. a you know. Well, it's a, even less than funny. lip service. Lip service, you say you're going to help and don't. True. But with th thoughts and prayers, you just don't. But the numbers involved here are important, aren't they? It's just like problems and population. The greater the numbers, the, the more complex the solutions and I actually, oh, go ahead. I actually have a bone to pick with praying because I actually think we know scientifically now that that actually makes the situation worse. There have been studies yeah. done on and, blind groups. Larry, do you want to take that? 
Well, it was a, I don't know who did the survey, but it was done MIT on did a, one. A, who? MIT did one. MIT okay. did one. Yeah. It was on heart patients when, before and after surgery. Uh, they were doing a, a, a separate groups, uh, groups that knew that they were going to be prayed for before they went into surgery. Poop people that knew that they weren't going to be prayed for before they went into surgery and a blind group that a uh, blind study group that wasn't told one way or the other. And they found out that the group that had the most complications was the group that knew that they were going to be prayed for before they went into service sur surgery, because when they came out, apparently they had more anxiety to be able to, I mean, to be better. Right. And that led to other complications after they came out of surgery. Yeah, so, so in a lot of ways, today. thoughts and prayers are something maybe even worse. Right. <laughs> don't tell me you're going to pray for me. Yeah, don't give me your thoughts <laughs> and prayers, please. Yeah. Like, don't me, if anything, jeez. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, had, I had an interesting experience, and that is I had a 5X bypass surgery about wow. three years ago. And, and afterwards, um, I wasn't feeling very well, of course, and my family was there. And the, um, a, a minister came in to come and give the prayers and so forth. Wow. And I was really, I was really annoyed, but I was stuck sort of in a social situation where you can't complain, even though in every respect I wanted to complain. But um, yeah, here, here's, here's the thing. That was, that was very useful or very useless, I should say, interaction. And it still annoys me to this day. I was being prayed for. I didn't want to be prayed for. I didn't want to have the social pressure of, of sitting there and being silent while I was being prayed for, but nevertheless, he was there. What's that? You couldn't talk? You were like prone and no, unable to speak? Okay. I talk, but I'm not going to embarrass my family because they're more uh, on the religious side. So there was a tremendous yeah, social pressure yeah, to just yeah. sit there being uncomfortable and keep my mouth shut. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I would not be the first to say this, but, you know, a lot of ministry leverages on the fact that it's socially expected for you to do what they're telling you to do because they yeah, come, keep your mouth shut yeah. stay in the pews and keep your mouth shut right yeah they have a, because what's the harm theory. right what's yeah. the harm yeah like what you don't believe in this because right else believes mm -hmm. in this it's the emperor's new clothes uh pressure <laughs> pressure system anyway uh, we got two minutes. I want to hear something cool. I want to know a cool emotional uh, belief that we have. I know for me, I'm willing to argue that Pokemon generation number one is the best generation of all time. I'm not willing to hear anything else. There's a reason why Charters R cards are selling for like $300,000 right now. And nobody knows what a Totodile is. It's the best generation, best art style, best set of 151 Pokemon. Boudreaux, I think you got Star Wars. I don't want to load your card, but like, what would you be your go-to emotional? Nah, don't care about beliefs. This is about emotion. Let's fight. Uh, I, man, I got, I got, well, I got a list of like a dozen here, <laughs> but I'll give you one. Um, I think, uh, uh, I think saying uh, it's worth a shot. It, it uh, was worth a shot is a meaningless statement. Yeah, you, know, uh. you, you, go, you, go, you go somewhere, you go 15 minutes out of your way to see if you can get like a closer parking spot or a better mm -hmm. deal. And then you don't get it. And then you come back, well, it was worth a shot. Mm. No, it wasn't worth a shot. You know that ball. <laughs> it's no longer worth a shot. It's a no. It's a no. no. Uh, Buffalo, do you have anything where you just like gut reaction, have like a belief you know is not absolutely rational, but you just enjoy it anyway? Um, I can't come up with it, uh, anything at the moment, but I would, I would respond to Eric's comment. Sure. And, and I would say, um, you know, it, it really annoys that, that annoys the uh, hell out of me when I'm tr riding with somebody and they do that, hmm. the parking lot, the, oh, the parking lot analogy. And, and again, you can't do anything about it really. You can yeah, spoil maybe the next 15 minutes of the interaction by saying something, but but it, it also drives me crazy that uh, why do, why don't why not just look around you and see how many people are being successful at this and see that it's most often not successful what? and then just behave that way. <laughs> <laughs> if only everybody tried to do that, that'd be great. We'd have a much better society. We would evolve as a culture. Scott, I'm going to throw this out at you. Uh, what's a fun pet peeve that's entirely emotionally based that you that you enjoy having? Uh, well, I don't know. Well, I guess I enjoy it a little bit, but. I feel like, um, you know, this positive thinking thing, like, mm -hmm. I don't think that positive thinking works. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on it. Like 
I could say like, well, I'm going to be really positive today and I'm going to go to the gym and this time mm-hmm. I'm going to lift, I'm going to bench, you know, this amount of weight or whatever the case is. And I just have to get my mind right and go in there and do it. And I go in there and it's like 50, 50. Sometimes I'm achieving my goals. Sometimes I'm falling short, but I don't think positive. So in that case, it seems like the evidence seems to me that the positive thinking thing has nothing to do with it. Ooh, that's just that's kind of an illusion, you know, like it's a, it's just to make me feel better about well, I mean, trying, yeah, that, motivating me to do something, but I don't know. We're going to touch that next half of the episode. Larry, what's your pet peeve? And then take us out. I got nothing. I, don't uh, know. <laughs> I, just, I know you got pet peeves. I, no, I've been I, around I, you long <laughs> enough. I know I, that's just the host and Larry talking. Cause he yeah. sees the clicking time clock. Mm. But, uh, Larry, go on ahead and take us out. Okay, this has been the, well, first half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Welcome to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Delder Five, and we're here on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, February 21st, 2020. Let's talk about the atheists and free thought groups that you can find right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, first, there's the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK. We were founded in 2002. We're going on our 19th year now. ASK has over a thousand members, and we have a weekly Zoom meeting during COVID where we can all get together and talk about anything we want to. Uh, you can find us online at Facebook or at knoxvilleatheist.org. You can also find us on Meetup or just by Googling Knoxville Atheist. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one. Start one. That's right. Earlier in the show, we said we'd talk about the atheist television or a video show. Well, they were on television for about 10 years until last year when they switched over to online services. You can find all of their work or their archives on YouTube. Just search for Knoxville Free Thought and you'll be able to pull up their archives. Uh, with us on our show today are Wombat, our regular co host. We have uh, Boudreaux and Doubtfire and uh, George. Uh, yeah. Buffalo, Joe. Buffalo. There you go. <laughs> and uh, what were we talking about today? Where are we going with this? Yeah, we're going over necessary supplies. If you are locked in your house for over a week, and I'm going to tell you, you need to be able to get, first of all, a lot of ice. You'll need a shovel, and then you'll need a fan. What a fan, what a fan, what a fan, what a mighty good fan. What a, what a mighty, 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 mighty good, good fan. fan. Guys, we're going over listener feedback <laughs> from last episode. I'm going to highlight two comments so that we can get right back into the thick of things. Dada's trading room, all the way from Hungary. I think he's in America, though. Uh, he says, if the universe... Actually, I think he's Polish. My bad, Dada. <laughs> if the universe were fine-tuned for us, or even created for us, shouldn't we, humans be around since the beginning of the universe yeah, and we're thought, kind of johnny come lately aren't we yeah yeah yeah. we in the grand scheme of things we are kind of late to the party if this what party was thrown for us mm-hmm. It'd be the equivalent of like doing a new year's party in may <laughs> we're showing up in may for a new year's party it's like hey showing up guys what's up by the way these are comments from our last episode last week which was the universe is trying to kill us and i thought the comment to Dada's training rooms comment was actually pretty good it was well, if the universe was fine-tuned for us or even created for us, shouldn't humans be around forever? And so I thought yeah. mm-hmm. two really good thought exercises for the fine-tuning argument. Like this universe was created for us. It's meant for us. Not only are we showing up late to its existence, not only does it seem like most places would kill us in this universe itself, but if it's fine-tuned for us, why aren't we 
better suited to exist in different kinds of areas in it and why can't we be around it forever why are we put into this place with an expiration date <laughs> well it's not only us i mean even if we were to stick around forever the sun won't be here for but for another five billion years Very true. we we know a lot about stars and the sun is a star we know yeah. it's going to run out of fuel in about five billion years mm. it's going to expand so much that our orbit the orbit of the earth will be inside the sun it will span that much in five billion years and so even earth, if we're around it would be an awfully hot place <laughs> yeah let me let me throw something up something else out too uh the ocean water the water that hit earth in a comet form most likely uh did not have as much salt in it as it does now the reason why it does have as much salt as it does now is because it's picked up from um, water streams rivers mountains etc and it collects and then it recycles and pours more water, I'm sorry, pours more salt and sediment and, 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 and ions of that sort in that collection pool that we call the ocean. Mm -hmm. It gets progressively more saltier. So there's a period, of, there will be a point before even the sun burns out where it's just, this water ain't good <laughs> We need to get some yeah. new water over here. We got to yeah, like- Be like the Dead Sea. Yeah, 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 basically, basically. So we have to, we have to uh, if anything, we have to do what we can do now for future generations to be able to preserve the, the quality of life that we have. We're not, qual we're not preserving the earth, because the earth will be here whether we're here or not, but we can make it a better experience for humans down the road if we are willing to take some responsibility today. And that's what we got to do. Hey, positive thinking by Mr. Guy who doesn't believe free will is an actual thing. So <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to dissect this a little bit. You're saying, Hey, when I have a positive mindset, I sometimes and sometimes don't find the motivation to do the work that I'm, that I'm tasked with doing. And that makes me think that there is a disconnect between positive thinking and, and motivation such that I can't force myself to get motivated or I can't push a button and be instantly motivated. And that makes me think that positive thinking in its own right may not actually be a thing that's worthwhile in the first place. Have you, have you tried the opposite? Have you thought negatively going into the gym thinking, ah, I can't bench press anything today. Uh, I'm going to feel terrible today. And then actually find the motivation to overcome that. You're on mute, my friend. Yes, actually, um, yesterday I was in the gym. <laughs> and what happened was, this is where why this is on my mind. Because yeah. Thursday, I went to work out. And yeah, I had all this positive energy and positive thinking. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And I got there and I failed. And I just gave up. And I was yeah. like, man, I'm just not feeling it. I'm out of here. Like it just, I just ran away from, from it, you know, mm -hmm. and I felt terrible. <clears throat> so I woke up <clears throat> yesterday. I was like, well, I've got to work out, but I'm again, I feel terrible. I, I it, it, it based on the memory of Thursday. I was, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just really starting to really be bad at this. And I went in there and I kind of drug myself in and start lifting weights. And I realized, wait a minute, I feel a lot stronger than I did Thursday. And I started getting into it and I was having fun with it. And so it just kind of dawned on me that all this positive thinking, negative thinking thing may just be kind of an illusory thing. Hmm. And based on everything that I, cause I did a lot of research about the free will stuff and some of the science behind it. And so it all started kind of coming together. Like I think these guys, these, these scientists, people, they really, they really know their stuff. Maybe. I always get triggered when someone says, these scientists <laughs> maybe say something, not the science says something, but I'm going to pull a page, <laughs> no, I'm I'm gonna pull a page out of George's book. Uh, George, let me know if this is compatible with maybe uh, logic that we might share. I think everyone's a bell curve. Generally, like there's, there's enough of a distribution of people where you might find that one thing works for most people, but on the fringes, not as well. And maybe positive thinking works for the bulk sample of people. And even there, maybe it's an equilibrium. Maybe it's more inclined to work with a certain group within that certain proportion. But as you get towards the longer fringes, you're going to need something else other than positive thinking or maybe something entirely different as you get towards the outliers to get someone to feel motivated. Because we are inherently 
different and unique animals. What do you think, George? Does that seem reasonable? Uh, yeah, it does, because I think almost everything is on a, on a bell-shaped curve. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it fits. I, and again, I think each one of us is, is so different, both inside and outside, uh, that, um, that one would almost expect it. I would almost expect it. How do you get so, yourself but, motivated? How do you get your actions yeah. to meet your beliefs? Yeah, it's, it's, you believe you're motivated, how do you get an there? Interesting question. I think, I think maybe more uh, sort of constant inner drives worked for me rather than wake up in the morning and, and have a thought about doing something. Although I do that, I sometimes wake up and decide I'm going to take on a certain task and I'll go and do it. Mm. But I don't really think about whether or not it's going to be successful because I'm experimentalist and I know that 20 75% of experiments usually fail. But <laughs> You, you've got to only 75. What field in science are you in? That's why he's got so many citations. But, but, but I, but my strong uh, feeling is, you know, you got to keep going. You may not be successful today, but you'll be successful tomorrow as long as you keep at it. Sure. Sure. Wisdom, wisdom from Buffalo. Uh, Larry, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I'm going to phrase this question slightly differently for you, but um, is there validity and positive thinking towards getting yourself motivated. And if not, how do you personally get yourself motivated? No, I think there is. Um, it, it may be not to the extent that most people tout it, but uh, I think that it, it um, gearing yourself up mentally for a task is, is halfway through the task. It really d it does, uh, not only because you're expecting the test to be a certain way and and generally if you meet it and it is that way then it may you have that much of it done i think that uh, a lot of anything that you do and my work was programming so i if i if i have a really good mindset about what i'm going to try to accomplish before i go in to do it sure. it helps me get through and mm -hmm. helps me get done quicker if it's a meant i mean a physical ta task i think it still sets you up for what you're going to be expected doing it but whether or not that particular day it works for you physically or not is something else okay Boudreau, throwing it out at you uh yeah. comments i yeah i, th I think maybe piggyback on what Larry's saying. I mean, the, I, I don't know that we can simplify the, the, the topic to, uh, to work for just anything, working out this or that, but imagine it has a strong influence of positive thinking will really help on certain things, uh, you know, where uh, you have a big influence on it, your subconscious has an influence on it. Whereas positive thinking is not really going to do you much good for playing the lottery, <laughs> right? right. Sure, um, the outcome is beyond your control. Sure. Right, right. So, so I think I, I think the, the topic is is important. It uh, might help sure. you accept yeah, the results. Yeah, context is very. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Now yeah. that is actually a really good point because when you go to a casino, for example, those places are specifically engineered to keep your bad thoughts at the back of your head and the happy, bright, <laughs> colorful, sonorific GCF bright pitches, bright colors those thoughts in the front of your face at all times and the promise yeah. of, Hey man, just one more pull of that, you know, yeah. lever. And you yeah, got a free buffet money. there. You don't, it, you yeah. don't think about the hundred dollars you drop when you yeah, yeah. in the hour you were there. Would you like a free drink, sir? <laughs> like all yeah. that stuff in a casino is specifically engineered. If you go to a mm -hmm. church, very much engineered without you maybe even realizing it, these mm -hmm. are places that are designed for you to not be able to hide behind desks. You're sitting in a pew, open, open chairs, kind of uncomfortable. You're standing up, you're sitting down, you're standing up, you're sitting down at very specific intervals. The songs aren't very intricate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Those songs, books. If they are, they're classical in nature. Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, we'll just say stimulating in the way to keep you placid. They aren't meant to like raise your heartbeat dramatically, but they are meant to keep you in that good frame of mind so that when the tithe bell or bowl or hat comes around, you're like, maybe I will give five more bucks today because literally everyone in this line gave five bucks and now everyone's looking at me. It's all engineered for you. Uh, you should be aware of that. Hey, Scott, what do you got? Hey, I was just thinking uh, just now when you, when you guys were mentioning that, um, mm -hmm about uh, making a dip, like how can we use our feelings to our benefit, right? Yeah. And I, it just dawned on him. I remember I was speaking, I used to, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I used to work with a, 
a Zen Buddhist um, person. And wow. we have all, we used to have all these kind of conversations all the time. So, you know, in Buddhism, they believe that there is no free will, there is no self and all of this kind of stuff. Right. So we were having this conversation and he told me a story. He said, the thing about it is there's a side of your consciousness, the unconscious or the subconscious that's way stronger than your executive functioning mind is what he was telling me. He's like, you know, your awareness, you know, your, this illusion, illusory part of your mind or brain is very weak. It's, it's, it's really not composite of what's really going on with most of the hard lifting is done in your subconscious mind. And he says, so there's this um, story, I think in, in Zen Buddhism, where he says, it's kind of like the rider on the elephant. You know, there's a rider on the elephant that says, go to the left. And the elephant always goes to the right. Hmm. And so every time he's telling the elephant to go somewhere, the elephant doesn't listen. But then, you know, he finally learned how to uh, trick the elephant into going where he wants it to go so that the elephant leads him where he wants to go. I forget exactly how the story goes, but it's basically that there's an elephant, the stronger part of you, which is your unconscious mind, mm -hmm. and you have to create these habits and start mm -hmm. recording this information into your unconscious so that it starts directing naturally. To paraphrase, you, you, have to kinda, you have to have a relationship with yourself to, to improve yourself in a way. Yeah. And it, and it takes time. Like it takes, um, it's, it's, it's called forming hat. It's like forming good habits is what he was telling me to put a capstone on the, uh, positive speaking topic. I think it's a form of pressure because I think we are very responsive to social pressure, obviously. I mean, we can look at, we can see that very clearly in society. And what we're doing when we're talking to ourselves to hype ourselves forward is to kind of put this stakes on ourselves to perform in a way that we are expecting. We are either personifying our expectations or talking to ourselves as like a, a secondary agent where it's like, hey, you can do this, you gotta do this. And then I receive that same message and be like, okay, I can do this, I can do this, I'll keep running up even though my body says stop because I said go, I will keep doing the going. And so if you format it away from just like, hey, I'm just talking to myself and maybe that may not motivate me. Maybe it's more of like, maybe I just don't respond well to pressure, <laughs> social yeah. pressure. And that's a hit mm -hmm. or miss for me. And I just need to find a better way to talk to my elephant or talk to myself in a way that's much more conducive towards getting the things that I need to get done. There's experiments that show when people are under pressure, like at work mm. and people are trying to really pressure you and you get nervous, you can't perform. Right. But if you're very relaxed and having fun, you're able to do things that you didn't think maybe you could do. Sure. And that could be a good way to inform our actions. Larry, I'm going to throw something fun at you. We had a comment on YouTube. I know you want to talk about it. I can see it in your eyes. There's a glint. Was in it eyes. <laughs> uh, well, it did deal with faith. And you know what? How about we handle it? It's from Tom Stone. He responded on a video from far back ago. We were talking about faith. Tom Stone says, you keep looking for full proof. Uh, if you are looking for full proof, then you will fail. You can develop what I call educated faith through great study and human experiments. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading, I'm reading this comment, just making sure, but an element of faith is required. When you develop full true faith, a connection with our mind becomes established and you can actually feel the divine presence. Divine is spelled with an E. <laughs> in this Be fine. But it's all fine and then deep medic deep meditation can also establish this connection good luck tiny humans <laughs> <laughs> i mean faith is i mean especially religious faith is believing without evidence um and he's saying it, once you do a lot of tests it reinforces your your faith well, that's right. experimentation. That's science. And uh, once you have a lot of experiments under your belt, if, if, you, if they're true testable results and not just you pointing to something saying that's God, uh, then if, if you've got good verifiable results and you've, you've done experiment, you've done, uh, you have everyday expectation of uh, uh, based on um, 
experience, which is what um, the dictionary would say uh, one of the definitions of faith is. There, are, you know, the problem with uh, a lot of religious people use faith, um, one definition to mean something else. Hmm. Uh, it's equivocation and it's an, a falsehood. So uh, I, I would just recommend people go to the dictionary, look up all the different definitions of faith, and you'll see that the one that um, atheists use are the everyday expectation based on experience and not believing without evidence. Yeah, it's unfortunate yeah. because even in the Bible, there's two definitions of faith that aren't compatible right. with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing to, a, to some effect here. Yeah. Uh, but at, if you want to... Go for it. Go for it, both if you want to do a good experiment, you better do at least three controls. And that means asking the difficult questions as well as the easy questions. Right. And if you're going to have an experiment, it only it can only do it can only run an experiment if it's falsifiable, which means you need to have a frame of reference for what it will look like if it's wrong, which means you have to be able to say, what would this look like if there was no God? What would this look like if faith didn't work? And you have to be honest with those answers. Or if it was a different God. <laughs> right. You can't say, well, I'll be dead, so I don't know either way. Like, that uh -huh. just means you have an unfalsifiable position, which I've heard many times. Uh, Larry, you got another comment as I'm going down here. La uh, one week ago, someone asked, is Larry a hologram? Now uh -huh. someone's asking, no. no, he's just a manifestation of the force, says Susan. That's, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> manifestation of the green screen. <laughs> Scott, so we had a, a nice chat about do our actions uh, inform our beliefs? Are our emotions really what's informing our motivations? Um, I'll leave one point and then love to hear your closing thoughts on the matter. Um, I find boredom to be the thing that I will subconsciously try to avoid at all costs. Even if it means I will do something that is painful or uh, terrible to my system, I will do it to avoid boredom. And by terrible, I mean like watch Desperate Housewives or something like that. <laughs> just <laughs> otherwise, just like anything to keep me from not being bored. I will turn on a TV while I try to go to sleep, like stuff like that that just do terrible things to my system. But when I am working out, I have a really, really hard time listening to radio music, which is what they play in the gym because radio music is very formulaic and I, I hate it when it's like, and here comes the course. It's always country music, by the way. I live in Tennessee. It's always country music. So it's like, here's the course. Oh, you live near and, Nashville. So yeah, and amazing. here's the title of the song right after the course. Nee, 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 nee. The pains of whiskey. It's like, oh God, I don't want to listen to this song anymore. And it just kills all my motivation. So I go in there with my own earbuds and I'll play the same playlist of music that I've curated specifically just so I can be like, if I'm at this part of the song, I should be at the, at the escalator or the treadmill. If I'm at this part of the song, I should be working my weights. And that works out so well, but even I'll get bored with that. So I have like a series of playlists for like different days. Some are randomized, some aren't. And that just helps to throw in variety just so I can avoid the boredom because I realize that's my, that's what my elephant hates. Achilles heel. That's my Achilles heel. And I think what you're saying, Mike, how you have to get to know yourself to, to be able to work with yourself better. Absolutely true. I feel like there is that relationship. And a lot of people don't give themselves time to figure that out. And that's what I find the benefit for those who, you know, like more of the, I don't need a dogma, but I do like the spiritual benefits of connecting with myself. It's like, yeah, like I feel like meditation gives you a chance to listen to your inner monologue, all that stuff. And that's beneficial to you. Roundtable thoughts, do you disagree? Buffalo, I'll throw it out at you, and then uh, we can leave it up to Scott for closing. Do you think well, there's a validity in that? Uh, meditation and all that stuff, to get to know yourself better and help to control yourself in terms of at least getting a better handle on your motivations. Can you do that through self-thought, meditation? What do you think? Well, I, under I understand that some people can, but I can't. I'm too impatient. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I just... I, I'm, I'm more worried about uh, losing patience than I am being bored. I mean, I'll argue it? this. You can uh, meditate in other ways other than just sitting down. Like some people, for them, it's drawing. For some people, it's skiing. For some people, it's walking in cow patties on frozen ice. I, uh, like, hey, you know. Lost yeah, the thought, okay. Man. All right. The, the walking analogy is a good one because it, it does, um, it, it is kind of meditating because I look around at the woods and I think about things that I see and, ask questions about why they are the way they are. 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I guess in that way, I, I I am meditating. I guess it just doesn't fit the normal definition of meditating. Sure, I'll give you that. Uh, but but I can rotate out of that very quickly uh, into something else. I think what motivates me is just if something's not working, then think about find some something that has more potential to work, sure. and move to that for a while. Hmm. Eric, yeah. how do you meditate, and do you see any benefit in doing it? I I I have I have an app. Uh, and I've tried it uh, a couple times. I really just haven't given it the time. You'd think in coronavirus, I have all the time in the world. I just, I don't. Uh, How do you I not? Really wanna, <laughs> I, 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 I've actually asked myself that. Like, okay, what is happening? But yeah, like, I just, what are you doing? All I, right, I yeah. feel like there's, there's just always a project going on or family stuff or i mean i just i don't have the free time that i thought i did and i was I'm filling up some of that with some music so i need to do i need to do it but um i i will say my uh, and i maybe mentioned this on the show before but it ties in nicely my my uh motivation is is a mind hack i try to hack myself into particularly exercise or other other habits like that my elliptical back there. I'm only allowed to get on that. Uh, I'm only allowed to watch my TV show that I like uh, while I'm on there. So I'm watching ah. The Expanse right now. Great show, uh, but I can't watch it, you know, on the big TV or anything. It's got to be right there on the iPad. So I've got like this inner like motivation. Be like, I want to know what happens to these guys. What's with the Rasenante? What's let's? I gotta figure out what's going on. I gotta go work out. So it, it kind of forces me to, to, to do that. So. I dig that. I dig that. That's you are, you are literally hacking your motivation, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you're yeah. making sure the carrots connected to the, the stick yeah. at all times. Right. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Uh, Larry, we were talking about before, um, about motivation. And now this is more of just a question of like, all right, so how do you get yourself motivated to get stuff done? And so for the things that you do like to do, whether it's writing or well, playing games, I, how do you I get have a, motivated? I have a saying that has held me in good stead all of my life. There are no souls? Uh, huh? No, no, no. Oh. That one too. But no, it, it, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a saying, you know, you, you get into something. You know, I'm really into the treadmill now, or I'm really into working out. <clears throat> and if there's something that you don't really want to do, but you have to do it anyway, you know, the, I, my saying is, if you can't get out of it, get into it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know try, to, try to set your mind that it's fun, that it's going to be good for you, that, you know, there's a the reward at the end. Uh, uh, you know, try to make it something that you could get into. I love that. I love that. I do have a saying myself uh, on that it's not as good as that, but it's more of like... Um, Mm, it's your that was so good if i can't get out i get into it um the time i enjoy wasting is not wasted time and so for a lot of the hobbies that i do where i feel like right. i'm losing time if i'm enjoying doing it and getting better at it right. it's not wasted time i like that and that I'm goes so along with the crosby stills and nash or, uh, song it says uh, maybe it was james taylor he said it there's so little time to do the things you want to do once you find them, mm. because it's really hard to find things as you grow up that and live your life that you really want to do. I mean, that are that really turn you on, the things that you're into, uh, and then you don't have time to do them. <laughs> okay, Scott, closing thoughts today. Yeah, hope we, hope we handled your subject well. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, I would just say that, um, you know, to be effective and, and, and when I say effective, like to be happy, to be, um, you know, to enjoy your time, to enjoy your life is to not ruminate and think too much and worry too much and be nervous all the time. And that suffering, it's like my Zen Buddhist friend used to tell me all the time, the guy was really smart on this stuff is that you know, thinking is suffering. And what he meant was mm. ruminating is suffering. And he says, so meditation, and he, and he used to always tell me that the best form of meditation is um, called dedication. If you can dedicate yourself to a thought or dedicate yourself to an activity or dedicate yourself to an interest, then you're going to lose the sense of time. You're going to lose the sense of self 
and you're just going to be focused and dedicated into this singular thing. And he says, and what is going to help you be more productive in life is while you're doing that, if you can just live in the moment, like when you are dedicated into your thing that you're focused on, stop for a second and just reflect on how you feel. Mm -hmm. Like reflect on the fact that you're not thinking, reflect on the fact that observe the fact that you're losing time and just in it. And I've done that. And this bad boy right here, nah, is that a new one? this is my tool for meditation. Cool. Since I got this bad boy just this last week. Yeah. He's showing another mixer board. This is a yeah, another mix, another, yeah. Synth engine. Yeah. And I've been working on that thing. And I tell you, man, it is so much fun. I've been so singular in my thought of just doing, of working with this thing. And man, um, after that, the next day when I go to work, it's like my mind is so relaxed and I'm so peaceful. Like before I was getting all this equipment and I was kind of stressed about a lot of changes that are going on in my life right now, hmm. along with work and other stresses. Um, but now I can really make a difference because I know how now to stop, be more singular in my focus and observe that thing. And it gives you like this sort of um, really peaceful, awe-inspiring feeling within you that, yeah, it makes you more productive in your other activities. Cool. Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful yeah. topic that we handled today. And I think I learned a lot today. It was really great cool. having everyone input. Uh, Boudreaux, where can we find your stuff at, man? Well, I think you put my latest video at the mid-show break, maybe last episode. Oh, yeah, last two episodes, That's, yeah. There's another song we're working on. Um, I'm finding it harder to, to, to play drums to this one because it's a bit faster. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll link you guys as we make more stuff. Quick question, what's BPM? Beats per minute. Yeah, what's not what is BPM, but what's oh. the BPM of the song? <laughs> you said quick. I was going. Uh, uh, I'll look. I'll look it up. Uh, but I mean, it's it's punk rock. So it's, is it like one twenty? Is it one thirty? Oh, geez, geez, geez. I mean, it's just punk is just two hundred. I mean, I mean, you're two hundred. Okay. I, I wouldn't even say it's the speed as much as the the, the tenacity. I mean, you're constantly sure. doing the same same rhythm uh, mm. without a break. So yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Drumming is a workout every single yeah, time. Yeah. 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 Good uh, help. George, do you have anything that you'd recommend that we would check out between now and next week? Um, no, I'll pass this time. Fair enough. I, I, uh, I, I talked about something the last time uh, that related to, to the universe, but I think I'll pass this time. Fair enough. Fair enough. I would recommend if you are on YouTube to check out on YouTube, Ninja Skating ninja skating and the reason why i say that is there's this whole guy who's developed this kata system this fighting system but it has flips and stuff while ice skating it's it's Ooh. done with laughs but it's just showing people being productive in a particularly snowy climate <laughs> with, with particularly inclement weather and making the best of it and it looks cool as hell the guy who films it is just so good and the guy's also a pro skater too so it's not just some dinky little thing the guy is actually really good ninja skating i check recommend you check it out larry sounds sounds, sounds a little bit like figures i i've done some skating myself and yeah and figures uh can get incredibly intricate and and beautiful once you learn how to do them Absolutely. but as a friend a friend of mine says and in fact a very accomplished skater says uh, figures are also like watching grass grow okay <laughs> in, other words, in other words they take so much time to perfect ah by so much practice i see yeah it's uh, true and they don't wear helmets either but they do when they practice sometimes so like there's the misconception a lot of people have figure skating skating in general is a very dangerous thing wear your pads wear your mouth guards there's a reason why a lot of people who don't don't have teeth larry why don't you take us out or what are your final thoughts okay well, i was just going to say that my own content uh can be found on digitalfreethought.com the blog is there the atheist songs the articles on the subject of atheism um is on digitalfreethought.com be sure to click on the blog button 
My book is called Atheism, What's It All What's About? It? And it's available on Amazon. If you have any questions for the show, you can email them to us. Thank you, Ty. Uh, at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org and we'll answer my future shows. If you're having trouble mentally or whatever emotionally from leaving religious beliefs behind, you can find help at recoveringfromreligion.org. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. This has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we'll see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.